All right, it is two o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Alley. I'm the director of the Rock Island Arsenal Museum at Rock Island Arsenal. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's program, which will explore the history of the Rock Island prison barracks. So the first thing we're going to do is actually start off with a little video to provide an overview of the barracks, and then we'll dive into, into a lot of the details uh, of the operations of the, the prison barracks, uh, some of the history surrounding it, and the units that, uh, that were stationed there. All right, so that gave you sort of an overview of the prison camp. And like I said, we're going to dive into uh, a number of the topics you saw uh, in that short video. But uh, the history of the camp began in August 1863. The U.S. Quartermaster Department sent Captain Charles A. Reynolds, who's pictured here, to oversee the construction of a POW camp for Confederate soldiers on the island of Rock Island. The Rock Island Barracks was one of 21 Union prison sites uh, spread across the country during the Civil War. Reynolds was ordered to construct a camp large enough to house 10,000 prisoners of war. Uh, when completed, it covered 12 acres on the north side of the island, consisting of 84 wood-framed barracks, each 22 feet wide by 100 feet long, surrounded by a 12-foot high fence. The image you see in the background is actually the plan for the POW camp that Reynolds put together, and, and this is how it was constructed. For those of you who are familiar with the island um, in the current day, uh, the camp basically stretched from Quarters 1 uh, to East Avenue or near where Quarter 7 is. Um, on the north side of the island. There's actually a stone marker that shows one of the corners of the camp um, so that's still that sits at the end of East Avenue today, um, but it covers what are you know the grounds of quarters two through seven um, and one of the holes of the old golf course. So that's that's where it is if you're familiar with the island itself, sort of to give you a point of reference. Uh, this is actually a drawing of one of the barracks um, that was one of the 84 barrack buildings that were here. This was drawn by Lafayette Lavender for one of the other prisoners at Rock Island Arsenal. Um, and this was drawn in 1864. On, on 3 December 1863, uh, so basically Reynolds shows up in August of 1863, lays out the camp, begins construction. On 3 December 1863, although the camp wasn't completed, 468 Confederate soldier prisoners arrived by train to be inter, um, interned at the camp. They were shipped from the railroad station at Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, many of these soldiers had been captured at the battles of Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge um, between November 24th and 25th, 1863. Uh, when they arrived at the western end of the island, local citizens uh, from the area actually gathered to watch them as they were marched on, onto the island and into the camp. So we're going to kind of do a quick run through of some images that were taken of the camp. Now, it's it's important to note that none of these buildings stand today. Um, the only uh, 
the only remains uh, that exist of the camp or tangible remains uh, is actually the, the Confederate cemetery that is still on the island and managed by the VA today. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, what you're looking at here are the headquarters buildings. Um, that's obviously the river off to the north. Uh, so this is where all the administrative offices were for the camps. This is the camp commandant. Um, a number of, of uh, Confederate prisoners were actually employed uh, in the headquarters buildings, many of them uh, taking on the role of, um, of clerks almost, taking roles of, of prisoners. And, and many of those records that those Confederates kept as part of the, the headquarters uh, were, are actually some of the greatest records we have of the prisoners kept at the camp. This is the hospital that was on the installation, or uh, that was part of the prison uh, prisoner camp. Again, you can notice some pretty rough construction on this. Uh, these buildings were not meant to be made um, in the best manner. They were made to uh, basically get by and get these prisoners places to, uh, you know, to be housed, to sleep, to eat, um, you know, to have a hospital. This is the garrison barracks, very similar to the hospital. Uh, in construction um, and style. This is the bell tower. This is actually a stereoscope. Uh, so those of you who aren't familiar with what a stereoscope is, you basically put it into a, um, uh, it's basically a contraption that you look through and both of the images are slightly offset. So when you look through it, um, you actually see what appears to be a 3D image. But a lot of the imagery we have of the camp are actually from these historic stereoscopes. Uh, so this is a bell tower. This was used to uh, to signal various things throughout the camp, meal time, um, you know, when they were doing their muster rolls, all of those sorts of things. And you can see some of the um, some of the prison guards are actually pictured there in the lower right hand corner of the image. Uh, this is actually taken on the outside of the of the wall. Another image taken on the outside of the wall, uh, pictured here, are actually members of the 108th USCT or US Colored Troops. Uh, they were guards at the camp for the longest stint, and we'll dive into the history of them a little later. Uh, but again, just to sort of give you a sense of the historic structures um, or the structures of the camp itself. All right, so on 5 December 1863, Colonel Adolphus J. Johnson assumed position of commanding officer of Rock Island Barracks. He's pictured here on the left. He served for the 20, month, 20 months that the camp was open um, for, for Confederate soldiers, that, and the camp itself was operated at a higher level by the quartermaster department. On the right-hand side, we have Major Charles P. Kingsbury, who was assigned to the island as part of the Ordnance Department and is considered the first commanding officer of Rock Island Arsenal. So it's actually kind of interesting. Um, two really important and impactful things happened um, in the history of Rock Island Arsenal during the Civil War. The first is um, the POW camp. Um, it's, it's one of our greatest connections to the Civil War. And second, in 1862, uh, Congress... Um, put forth an act that a arsenal should be established on Rock Island um, for the repair, refit, and production of, of arms and ordnance and equipment. And so these two entities, the uh, prison barracks and then the arsenal itself were sort of coming into being at the same time. Unfortunately, what that also led to is a fair amount of, um, of competition for supplies, resources, and all those sorts of things. And unfortunately, the camp tended to uh, get the upper hand on that time and time again. And, and Kingsbury, uh, the only arsenal building he actually finished uh, was Storehouse A, what we know today as the clock tower that sits on the western end of the island and is now home uh, to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Rock Island District. It's actually the only arsenal building that he was able to complete uh, during his time here. Um, before uh, Brevet General uh, Thomas J. Rodman came to the arsenal and master planned what we know as the arsenal today. So let's talk a little bit about the various um, units that guarded the POWs at the camp. There's actually some really great history um, and interesting tidbits about nearly all of them. 
The first soldiers assigned as guards to the prison barracks were from the 4th Veteran Reserve Corps, uh, which was composed largely of men who were physically unable to serve in the field uh, due to wounds or other disabilities. Um, they were shortly replaced uh, by the 37th Iowa Volunteer Infantry, uh, better known uh, by their nickname, which was the Greybeards. Uh, the Greybeards consisted of men aged 45 years or older. Uh, some of their members had, in fact, served during the War of 1812. The regiment itself was raised in Muscatine, Iowa, trained in St. Louis, uh, and then they were assigned first to guard Confederate POWs at the Illinois, the former Illinois State Penitentiary at Alton, Illinois, and then they were assigned as to guard prisoners at Rock Island in January of 1864. According to the records of Captain James Crane of Company K, the regiment was rated as generally good for the month preceding their duty at Rock Island, but dipped drastically a month after arriving. Crane noted, quote, discipline, tolerable, arms, in poor order, accoutrement, in poor order. So um, I'm going to guess being closer to home was not a benefit uh, to the Greybeards. The 108th U.S. Colored Troops, or USCT, served as, as the prison guards at the prison barracks from September 1864 until May 1865. The longest tenured guards during the war, the regiment's officers were white, while the enlisted were largely former slaves and freemen from the state of Kentucky. A little bit of history on the, US, um, on the 108th USCT. They were originally organized at Louisville, Kentucky on June 20th, 1864. They served garrison and guard duty at various points in Kentucky. They saw action at Owensboro, Kentucky, and then served guard duty at Rock Island um, again between um, September 1864 and May 1865. The 108th arrived from Louisville uh, after a three-day train ride, relieving the 37th Iowa Volunteer Infantry Regiment, the Greybeards. Uh, within the first few weeks, 200 men of the regiment actually reported sick and not fit for duty. So we're talking about a pretty large percentage. Um, on October 1864, William English was the first man from the regiment to die at Rock Island. 53 others would soon join him during the nine months of the regiment's service at Rock Island. Uh, those who died contracted various diseases, including inflammation of the liver, measles, uh, consumption, typhoid fever, pneumonia, diarrhea, paralysis, and malaria. The arrival of the 108th USCT created an uproar among the prisoners. One prisoner wrote, quote, 80,000 Southern men today are guarded by their slaves who have been armed by the tyrant. Um, obviously a direct um, uh, uh, note to uh, the, the term tyrant being used to refer to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the black soldiers of the regiment received a poor reception from the townspeople of Davenport as well. The Davenport Democrat uh, newspaper reported the following after one occasion, quote, these black boys in blue are getting to think less of white trash than ever. It seems as though there was a screw loose on the island, else so many would not have been allowed to come over here at once to startle the usual peaceful citizens of Davenport into such fearful commotion. And this was in reference to members of the 108th USCT traveling to Davenport as part of their ability to get off the island um, and interact with the local community. Um, life in the Army, even though um, you know they did not see, receive a warm welcome from the prisoners or from the local citizenry, uh, life in the Army seemed agreeable to most men of the unit, as evidenced by the lack of disciplinary actions on their service record. Um, there was only one notable exception, uh, an individual named James Robert, who was court-martialed for insubordination, uh, which was disobeying a lawful order and absent without a pass. The unit itself, uh, after they left Rock Island prison barracks, they were ordered to assemble for movement to Vicksburg. Uh, they would end up going into Mississippi uh, at the end of the war, where they would build roads, schools, um, they would lay telegraph lines, a lot of just general improvement uh, projects. So 108th USCT, a number of the members of the unit uh, actually went on to serve in what we know today as Buffalo Soldier Units. Uh, so this would be the 9th, 10th Cavalry, 24th Infantry uh, that would serve out in the West, you know, until the turn of the century. So many of these individuals who uh, got into the USCT as a way to escape slavery, uh, would end up taking on army life uh, as a career. So it, it again, was pretty, uh, pretty impactful on most of them. What's also really interesting to note about the 108th USCT um, is that when they were ordered to Rock Island prison barracks from Louisville, 
they were ordered to travel with three days rations uh, and supplies for a three day march to get them there. Um, and they were told not to bring any family. Well, a lot of them did. Uh, and what's what's really great is there are a number of descendants still in the Quad Cities area of members of the 108th USCT. Um, I've spoken to several of them. They're you know, really engaged with their history and their genealogy. Uh, and so it's really interesting that, you know, this, this, um, you know, black regiment from Kentucky, um, actually this community today, uh, member, many of their descendants were, uh, founding members of many of the, um, first African-American churches in this area. Uh, and so it's, it's really incredible to see the lasting impact, uh, this unit had when they came, uh, here to Rock Island prison barracks, obviously an impact that no one ever would have expected. Uh, I'll also point out that you'll see a number of images uh, up on the screen of members of the 108th USCT. These are all um, veterans of the unit. The majority of these pictures were actually taken over in Rock Island uh, when they were here at, um, at the prison barracks as guards. And a number of the company commanders uh, basically footed the bill for them to go over and, and be photographed in uniform. And so it's a really great um, uh, it's, it's really great that they were able to capture um, these individuals because in most cases we don't have images of a lot of the U.S. colored troops that served during the American Civil War. Now I'm going to touch on um, a series of watercolors that were painted by an individual named John F. Gish. Uh, he was one of the prisoners, so not a guard. We're focusing on a prisoner now. Uh, he was a member of Company A, 24th Alabama Infantry Regiment. He was among the first roughly 500 prisoners that came to the prison barracks in December of 1863. He was captured at the Battle of Missionary Ridge um, and, uh, again, arrived in December 1863. And he was here for almost the entirety of the operations of the camp. So he wasn't released until 17 June of 1865. What's really great about these particular items, these are actually artifacts that are in the holdings of the Rock Island Arsenal Museum. And what we know about these watercolors is that uh, John Gish painted these likely for sale um, so he could purchase supplementary food, supplementary clothes to what he was given as a prisoner. Um, and what's incredible about these is they really you know, he was there, he was experiencing, you know, the hardships of being a prisoner, you know, it was not a great place to be, but he does capture camp life uh, in a way that, that we really don't have captured in any other fashion. And so actually zoom in on a couple things here. Uh, so you'll see actually on the top, this is, uh, this is the wall that's sort of the 12 foot wall that surrounded the prison barracks. Uh, you see soldiers overseeing the um, the prisoners there, and then the series of three images on the back, and I apologize that they're a little blurry, but you'll see um, some prisoners, uh, you know, playing marbles uh, there on the left-hand side. Uh, the next over, you see prisoners carrying water from one of two water spigots that were uh, in the camp itself. You can actually see the second one in the background of that middle image. And on the right-hand side, which kind of ties directly into these particular paintings, uh, you see a wagon. Um, this wagon is actually the sutler that for a short time um, was allowed to come on and sell things to the prisoners. Again, largely supplementary food, supplementary clothing. Um, and through the sale of things like these, these artwork pieces, um, Gish was able to purchase, you know, that additional, um, you know, those additional items for himself. Now, again, this isn't probably what, you know, what the yard would look like on every day because it is, you know, it's a very broad image, but it does give you a sense of, of the kinds of things that were happening uh, and that the prisoners were doing to pass the time. Uh, now, it's also kind of a good time to note a little bit about life as a prisoner at Rock Island Prison Barracks. Uh, so a lot has been made um, about Rock Island Prison Barracks. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of that is attributed to Margaret Mitchell's novel, 
uh, Gone with the Wind, where one of the characters is sent to Rock Island Prison Barracks, and um, basically the way it's described is, is hell. Uh, it's been referred to as the Andersonville of the North. Um, you know, you take a look with the his, um, modern historiography on it, uh, we actually know that you had a better chance of surviving as a prisoner at the Rock Island Prison Barracks than you did serving in a frontline Confederate unit. Um, the death rate was not nearly as high as it was at Andersonville, not even close. Uh, but again, it's amazing sort of what uh, um, uh, what books, especially popular literature, uh, can make us believe or make us think. Uh, so that's one of those those interesting, um, you know, rumors or myths surrounding Rock Island Prison Barracks is that it was comparable to Andersonville. But in fact, if you actually, you know, take the numbers, you know, the numbers of POWs who were, you know, interned at the camp and you look at the deaths and you look, um, you take those and, and compare the percentages, um, you, you actually, uh, again, this is not, it's not saying it was a great place to be, but it most certainly was not, um, was not the hell on earth that Margaret Mitchell uh, made it out to be. All right, so a little bit about life as a prisoner. Uh, so this actually image of the interior of the camp, this is roll call. Um, we know this is, this is pretty staged. There's a number of different, uh, different smiles on there. So these guys knew they were getting their picture taken. Um, they're also turned out in all of their, um, all of their best, uh, clothing. See a lot of belt buckles, those sorts of things. Uh, this was a punishment uh, for prisoners who were breaking rules. Uh, this is called riding the mule. Uh, basically, they're sitting on a on a thin piece of lumber. They would sit on there for you know x amount of time. Uh, these are prisoners that are actually uh, they're actually making things again uh, to reference back to the Gish paintings. Um, prisoners made a variety of different things that they could sell to the, the area citizenry um, to supplement again uh, their food and clothing. And so you actually have prisoners who are making little trinkets um, out of various materials, soapstone, um, you know, anything that they could find, basically on. Uh, on the banks of the Mississippi or, or that could be sent to them. And, that, and that's another thing worth noting too, you know, while they were selling or making things for sale to, to the local community, um, many of them were also receiving care packages from loved ones back home. Um, it was actually a, a pretty decent system um, of, of mail at the time. Uh, and so, you know, we do have a couple of diaries kept by some, by a couple of the uh, a couple of the prisoners, and one of them, his name's Lafayette Rogan, um, he, he mentions regularly receiving letters from his wife, uh, as well as care packages. And so, uh, you know, they were receiving, uh, you know, supplements to their, um, you know, to their, um, I see that note in the, um, in the chat, someone mentions Camp Douglas being closer to the likes of Andersonville. It was certainly much larger. There's, there's no doubt. And, and again, you know, the deadliness of the camps was largely due to the fact that um, disease was running rampant. Um, there was no quarantine point um, between where most of these Confederates were picked up and and dropped off at the camp. So whatever they were hauling with them um, and spreading, uh, you know, there was no quarantine point to make sure it had run its course before these folks came into the prison camp. And that also goes back to the huge impact that disease had on the 108th USCT uh, when they arrived as, as prison, you know, you're talking 20% of their forces are, you know, dying <laughs> um, or, or in, in hospital beds within, you know, two weeks of arriving at the camp. Um, you know, they were, um, you know, they were getting impacted by the disease that was affecting the prisoners. Um, as we know, in, uh, in today's world, um, you know, viruses and, and bacteria, they're equal opportunity, doesn't matter who you are. Um, and, and back then, it was the same way. So uh, certainly, um, back to back to the comment about Camp Douglas, yes, it was it was probably closer to to an Andersonville, but but mostly that was due to a lot of the scale and size. So, you know, there were a couple of ways um, you could actually get out um, of the prison camp. There were there were a couple of ways you could do so. On 8 December 1863, uh, so it was actually just a few days after the camp received its first uh, first prisoners, 
President Abraham Lincoln announced an amnesty proclamation for Confederate soldiers. Any prisoner who pledged allegiance to the United States and agreed to enlist in Union military service was granted amnesty. These soldiers were inducted into the U.S. Navy or the U.S. Army for frontier service in the West. During the time of its operation, the Rock Island prison barracks, um, or during its operation, approximately 3,000 or about a quarter of its total prison population uh, became galvanized Yankees. So, you know, there were ways to get to get out of the camp. Um, that was one way. Uh, the other the other way were prisoner exchanges during the course of the war. Um, 3,876 prisoners were exchanged from Rock Island. Uh, 5,581 prisoners were released. Uh, a lot of those, again, to uh, as part of this amnesty program. Uh, 1,964 prisoners died. 730 prisoners were transferred and 41 prisoners actually escaped uh, from the camp. So on 1 July 1865, um, the last two prisoners actually walked out of the POW camp. Even though the Civil War ended on April 9th, 1865, um, the, the camp did not release its first two prisoners because they were actually in the hospital um, at, uh, at the prisoner, prisoner of war camp. In the 20 months of its operation, the prison barracks held a total of 12,192 prisoners. Um, to re revisit some of those numbers that I just went over, 5,581 prisoners were released, 3,876 prisoners were exchanged, 1,964 prisoners died, and 730 prisoners were transferred, 41 prisoners escaped. Um, today, the only tangible remains of, um, of the prison barracks itself is the Confe uh, Confederate Cemetery, still located on the arsenal and managed by the Veterans Administration as part of the National Cemetery. So what I'd like to do now is I know there's a lot of questions surrounding this topic, and so I'd like to turn it over to the group uh, or to, the, to our viewers if there are any, um, any questions they may have. Um, before we do that, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about our upcoming programs. Our next program is in January 10th, so or on January 10th, it's in the new year. Again, it's a Sunday at 2 o'clock. Uh, it'll be about preparation for war, which will cover the um, history of the pre-World War II Army maneuvers, which has a great tie to Rock Island Arsenal uh, because many of the new technologies that were being fielded during those maneuvers um, were actually developed at Rock Island Arsenal or tested at Rock Island Arsenal. A lot of them didn't get into the field uh, once 1941 hit, but... Um, you know, we have a great tie to that. Um, and with that, um, I am monitoring the, the chat box uh, or the comment thread. So if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to type something in there and I will answer it to the best of my ability. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you guys have any questions, you know, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to put into the comment box, just reach out to, uh, to the Rock Island Arsenal Museum on our Facebook page. Um, and just shoot us a message. We'd, I'd be more than happy to have myself or our staff answer any questions you may have. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to the group for you know, 10, 15 minutes um, for any questions you may have. Thank you. Great. So question I just received, how and when did the prison turn into a U.S. arsenal or was it an arsenal preceding the war? Uh, so those things actually happened concurrently uh, and separately. In 1863, they established the prisoner of war camp. In 1862, Congress actually um, passed a bill that said there would be an arsenal established on, on the island. And so the, the prison camp was being built uh, while planning for the building of the arsenal was occurring at the same time, uh, but they were happening separately. When the POW camp closed down in 1865, then building on the arsenal really went into full swing. And then we started having, you know, the building of the stone shops and, and those, main, uh, those main buildings that we still have today. Uh, how many prisoners again? So over the course of its 20-month operation, 
12,192 total prisoners were held at the prison. Um, now, those were not all at one time. That was just during the entire 20-month operation. So there were, you know, there were prisoners coming in and out. Some of them were uh, moving to, you know, those frontier units I mentioned earlier as part of the amnesty program. Some of them were being transferred. Some of them were dying. Um, so again, that that was that's the the total number that came through. Uh, see a comment about recalling the hospital stood well into the 20th century. Um, if I recall correctly, it, it it maybe lasted to the tur like really close to the turn of the century, like just into the turn of the century. Most of those buildings were just not um, were just to to last. You know, they the construction was poor, um, and they weren't really able to to turn them into much of anything as part of the ar arsenal's operation. Uh, let's see. Most of the prisoner barracks um, weren't purposefully demolished. Most of them fell in on the on their own uh, and then were cleared. Um, is it true Rock Island Arsenal is being prepped to be the capital of the South um, after the war ended? I don't know about that one. Um, I would have to look into that. I have not heard that one before. Um, what role did Colonel Davenport's home play in uh, the prison installation? Uh, so it wasn't part of the installation at all. Um, the Colonel Davenport house had actually fallen into uh, into disrepair. You know, it wasn't until about the turn of the century, so about you know 40 years later, um, that the old Settlers Association actually took it on and started started refurbing it. But it was not um, any part of the um, of the installation itself. Let's see, scrolling back up. Uh, I see a question about Colonel Hoffman. Um, I don't have a lot of information on Colonel Hoffman. I I have heard the same thing you have about being hostile to the prison uh, population. I know that um, you know he's the one that shut down the sutler coming onto uh, onto the or within the confines, I guess, of the prison barracks to stop selling things to the prisoners. Um, so yes, there are uh, some anecdotal references to to being harsh to the prisoners, uh, but that's about all they have, um, unfortunately. And I and I apologize. I wish I had more on that. Um, other questions? So there is there a searchable list of the prisoners who were released or escaped? Uh, yes, we actually maintain those records at. Um, at the museum, uh, and we have them in a searchable format. We actually have an interactive in the museum, not that it does anyone any good because we're closed right now. Um, but Joyce, if you want to reach out to, um, if you want to reach out to us on Facebook, uh, just shoot us a message and give us a name, and we can we can look up and see if we have anything. You know, generally we'll have a unit, um, we'll have a name, unit, um, where they were captured, uh, and some other you know odds and ends. Um, you know, if they died here or, you know contracted anything so we do have that um can the public visit the cemetery yes you can um access to the back to regular operations getting to uh, getting to the cemetery is no different than going to the national cemetery so you'll still have to get a visitor pass to come onto the installation to do so um but you can certainly do that um uh, shameless plug, I would also recommend going to the museum, uh, going to the Colonel Davenport House, the Mississippi River Visitor Center, um, if you go through the effort to get your visitor pass and come on and visit the cemetery. Uh, was the water reservoir demolished in, in fairly, uh, fairly recent history run into the camp? No, it was not. So that was actually originally part of uh, Brevet General uh, Thomas J. Rodman's plan for the Rock Island Arsenal. Um, one of the other myths is that Confederate labor was used to build the arsenal. Um, that's just frankly not true. And I've also heard reference to uh, the stone bridge um, that sat, well, most recently sat at the end of the driving range for the golf course was built by Confederate POWs. Um, also not true. Actually, where that sits would have been the kind of southern edge of the, the camp itself. How is, the, is it for the general public to come over and visit the Rock Island Arsenal Museum? Uh, when we are open, it is very easy. Uh, you just come to the Moline Gate um, and you'll get a visitor pass. You just have to provide a driver's license and they'll actually give you a hard card 
plastic pass that's good for a year, and then you can access the installation. Uh, right now, due to COVID-19, none of the publicly accessible places are open, um, and so they're, they're not handing out passes because you can't go those places. But generally, it is very easy to get on the installation, and you have a pass that's good for a year, uh, so you can just drive up to any gate you want and, and get right on. Um, I'm working my way down, so you'll have to work with me. Uh, what artifacts are currently on display about the POW camp? Yeah, so right now we have on display uh, some of the small trinkets that the prisoners made. We also have a violin, um, or fiddle probably, um, you know, they being from the South, that was used by one of the POWs or owned by one of the POWs uh, at the camp. Uh, we don't have the watercolors that I mentioned, the GISH watercolors on display, largely because they're watercolors and they're very susceptible to environmental hazards, you know, light, humidity, those sorts of things. Uh, but we do have reproduction of reproductions of those on display um, at the museum. Let's see, did they used to place flags on the Confederate graves on certain holidays? Yes, they did. Um, and the VA um, halted that practice. What was the most common cause of prisoner deaths? Um, typhoid was one of them. Um, dysentery was a big one. Consumption was a big one. Um, you would be surprised at the number of um, um, <laughs> at the number of prisoners who died of diarrhea. Um, it was again, it was mostly disease. The 1,964 um, POWs who who died during the operation of the camp. It was largely disease. The same goes for again most of the Union prison guards. Um, they were dying of the same things. Uh, how did the prisoners escape? There were a variety of different ways. There was a um, there was a cistern that ran under the camp and supplied the water. A lot of them got out that way. Uh, we, you know, the camp sat on a river, so you did to a certain degree have an easy means of escape. Um, the river wasn't controlled by by the the Corps of Engineers at the time, and so you know, in drought, you could walk across the river from the island to Davenport um, because it was still a it was still Rock Island Rapids. So, you know, there, there were probably a number of different ways uh, that they could get out. Uh, still working my way down. Yes, the flags placed on Memorial Day. That's the day, and that's when they do them, um, is one of the groups and one of the days that places the flags. Uh, does the Arsenal Museum hold any papers or artifacts from Camp McClellan? Uh, no, we do not. Um, that's a whole nother talk about the history of Camp McClellan and the training camp that sits over at um, what anyone in the area knows as McClellan Heights. But no, we unfortunately do not hold any of the any papers or artifacts from Camp McClellan. Um, Thank you, Greg uh, Swanson. The museum is really wonderful. I appreciate that. All right. Has there been any archaeology done on the barrack site, specifically much of it being now a golf course? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, and, and again, we've, we have a lot of uh, information about digs that were done around the Davenport house. Very little. And again, most of that is because, you know, these buildings, when they were built, they were just not built solidly or permanently. And so there's not, it's mostly wood construction. There's not a lot of remains there. And then anything we have recovered, um, you know, the, the stuff from, from the prisoners that was sold to the local citizenry came to us largely from the community. So that's, that's where most of that came from. So no, um, no archaeology that I'm aware of. Much of a Navy presence on the river, um, not that I'm aware of in this area. Um, I think most resources were <laughs> were pushed to the east or further south. Um, you know, we're pretty far up the river. I think the first, the big, you know, the first big naval presence you have are the shipyards down in the St. Louis area, um, the Eid shipyards that were down there. That that's really the closest naval presence that you would have. And, and again, those are largely shipyards. We're just pretty far north. Um, that there really wasn't much of a. I mean, we're pretty up here. We're pretty far removed um, from for the need to have any U.S. Navy protection. Most of most of those forces were again further south or um, or in the east. All right, I think I caught up with all the questions. Or does anyone have anything else?
nothing heard from the group so i will go ahead thank you very much um, i will go ahead and close this down if you do have any questions either continue to comment on the video um, or reach out to us directly um, on our facebook page shoot us a message and i'd be happy to answer any questions you may have uh, thank you all for tuning in i really appreciate it uh, and have a great rest of your sunday thank you very much